All right. Hello, everyone. So, generally speaking about cryptography, we tend to say that private keys are essentially secrets that needs to be protected from any unauthorized user space access. And specifically, if you talk in terms of Linux kernel, uh, you wouldn't like the secure uh, use security use cases like file encryption, disk encryption, or protecting the metadata of a file. It, file. Uh, to be exposed to any unauthorized user space access. So in this presentation, we are going to discuss the concept of trusted and encrypted keys inside Linux and how a trusted execution environment could fill in the gaps over there. So a quick intro about myself. Uh, I'm Sumit Garg, working as part of support and solutions team, Linaro, especially responsible for activities related to security, toolchain, etc. So let's get started with the topics I would like to cover during this session. Firstly, I will briefly provide you an introduction to the kernel keys and their use cases. And then we will see at how this trusted and encrypted keys provide the confidentiality protection to those from any user space compromises. Uh, and then we will, uh, those kind of trusted and encrypted keys, these depends on a TPM device uh, as a backend. And then we will discuss a system without a TPM device, especially an embedded system, and see how uh, a trusted execution environment could fill in that gap to support as an alternative. Lastly, we will have a look at uh, the mechanism to have T-based trusted keys and the usage details. Okay. So let's get started. Uh, firstly, about the kernel keys. Uh, a kernel key is kind of a cryptographic data or any authentication uh, unit uh, or anything that could be represented as part of a struct key. Uh, and it provides a key retention service that is kind of to cache your keys in the kernel for the security use cases. And it provides a special key type called key rings uh, that are there to hold uh, references to the cached kernel keys. So for this session, uh, we will try to keep it focused towards the cryptographic keys only so that we don't deviate too much uh, and discuss this file encryption, disk encryption, and all these use cases. So moving forward to the key retention service. So. In this, uh, in the user space, we have this key CTL utility that is there to manage keys in the kernel that is normally used to do syscalls like add, update, or read, or revoke. In the kernel space, we have key rings that are holding the references. This could be of three types, a system key ring, session key ring, or a user type key ring. And on the right-hand side, these are the security use cases within the kernel. Uh, and on the left-hand side, we have the trust source. This is the thing we would like to focus during this presentation. Um, moving forward. Coming on to the use cases, the first one would be uh, this file system encryption. So it could be implemented on two, on two parts. Uh, one could be a layered file system encryption that could be on top of your native file system. Uh, an example of that would be eCryptFS. And the second, would, uh, second uh, methodology would be to implement in the native file system itself. So that is for better performance reasons. So it requires a per file encryption key. Uh, and that key is wrapped using a master key. But what about the confidentiality of this master key? So we would not like to have this compromised uh, due to the user space unauthorized access. So we would like to have a trusted master key uh, that protects against those attacks. Uh, second use case is the block layer encryption. That is, the example is the DM crypt that uses a single key to encrypt the whole disk at the block layer level. Uh, again, here, having a trusted master key would, uh, would allow us to perform the operation securely. There is a third use case uh, that is extended verification module, or we call it EVM in the kernel. So it detects any offline tempering of the security extended attributes. Uh, if there are any, basically, 
corrupt, corruption of those or so those security and uh, extended attributes those mainly contain this lsm attributes uh, which are, are mainly responsible for the lsm policy decisions and second secondary this ima appraisal decision they basically contain a ima hash so which needs to be protected against any tampering so some of the extended attributes i have listed here uh, like security.ima security.slnx etc so at boot time this evm needs a high quality symmetry key for the hmac encryption of the file metadata so this key needs to be trusted uh, to protect against again any user space compromises so that's these are the use cases which we would try to address via which the trusted and encrypted keys framework does in the linux so it was introduced in kernel version 2.6.38 uh, it provides variable length symmetric keys which could only be accessible in plain in kernel because that that's where all the crypto operations are being done and user space only sees them as encrypted and blobs while uh, loading and store operation and it provides these two new key types in the kernel trusted key type and the encrypted key type in the next slide we will uh, go into deeper details about these key types and what they refer to on the left hand side is it's the trusted key type so we'll go uh, discuss it in details uh, it relies on a hardware based trust source like tpm uh, it's a random key that is generated using the trust source rng and the trust source contains a secret key that never leaves it to seal and unseal that uh, trusted key and it's mostly used as a master key to wrap these encrypted keys on the other hand this encrypted key they doesn't depend any, on any trust source like tpm and they are faster to operate with uh, rend th these are also kind of random keys which are generated using kernel random numbers pool and the master key for them to wrap either you could use a trusted key or if that's not available you you rely on the user space key but that's not something that it's mu much more secure so and these are the kind of keys which are mostly used for the actual encryption and decryption operation that is carried for disk or while the file or the evm part right uh, i'm moving on to the specifics how this trust source as acts as a back, back end for the tpm in case of trusted key so you have a key ctl utility in the user space and in the kernel you have this trusted key payload that has two parts to it one is the key that is in the plain text and the other is the blob format so whenever uh, this key ctl issues a command to create a new trusted key so the trust tpm driver issues a seal command to this tpm to use the storage root key to seal it inside and just provide the blob outside and then uh, now the user space can issue a read command to just read this encrypted blob and save it in the file system and later on across reboots or whenever that's required it could uh, load it back to the keyring uh, and at that point of time the tpm driver issues an unseal command to the tpm device to use again this storage root key and provide the key in the plain text to the kernel to operate with uh, one thing to notice here is this optional pci value this is act as a salt to the seal and unseal operations so that uh, you could bind a uh, trusted key to a particular state of the system that is mostly uh, applicable in a measured boot kind of a system where you have pci values uh, so that you bind a particular trusted key so that when a, a machine has a particular pci value it could only then be unsealed okay so that's that about this so so what about a system without a tpm device especially an embedded system so and the reasons could be for an embedded system uh, could be an additional hardware uh, which causes the increase in the bomb cost and there are constrained hardware resources you, co you couldn't have that much of die area to put a tpm device on there on an embedded machine 
So talking about an alternative to that could be a software-based TPM, like we have firmware TPM inside the T. Uh, but that, again, comes with, the, with its own shortcomings, like a big and complicated software stack, of which we may be interested in small feature set, like this trusted keys or Mayer boot. Uh, and secondly, um, it mi there, there might be possibility that embedded device doesn't provide you enough flash space to just uh, load that one MB kind of stuff of firmware TPM along with the boot firmware. So thinking about this, uh, what about having a T directly acting as a TPM, rather, uh, as an alternative to TPM? So that's the thing uh, we will try to discuss in the next slide. Now T as a trust source. So T uh, specifically based on the ARM trust zone that provides you that hardware-based isolation to perform the trusted operations, especially Opti, which provides uh, a standardized API to exploit this hardware unique key um, for any operations. So this hardware unique key could be seen as an alternative to the storage root key uh, that TPM provides uh, for the seal and the unseal operations for trusted keys. So unsealed, a trusted key that could be only unsealed on a particular hardware, um, not any other hardware. So it's kind of, now let, let's get into the details of how th this would work, uh, how this would plug in with the kernel interface. So you have this early user trusted application that would provide this three invoke commands to create a new key seal a key and unseal a key. Uh, and it uh, utilizes this system pseudo TA, which exposes this hardware unique key to the trusted applications only. So it uses this hardware unique key to seal a trusted key and seal and provide the encrypted blobs back to here. So here, the user space doesn't see any difference to the way it operates. It's only the back end that is plugged in with a T instead of a TPM. Uh, so while working on this, I got stuck with this issue like the, uh, normally the T framework uh, provides equal access to either a user space or a kernel client uh, to the trusted applications, any trusted application. So we need to restrict uh, the trusted application access for the user space, especially for the trusted key use case, because we wouldn't like that uh, user space should be able to directly de-blobify that um, encrypted blob that is uh, accessible. So we uh, introduced uh, this private login kernel method that is specifically like uh, any accesses from the user space using this uh, login method would be denied. Only the kernel would be allowed to open open a session with the trusted application using this login method. Okay, so that's all. Uh, now coming on to the kernel interface. So um, a year back I added this T-Bus framework in the kernel to talk to this uh, uh, devices in the trusted execution environment. So what it does is it uh, normally a driver registers on the T-Bus uh, with the UUID, that is this T client device, device ID. And whenever the enumeration happens, so and a match is found using this API, then the corresponding driver is invoked. So that's the common interface uh, which was added in the Linux kernel recently. Uh, so that's that. Now coming on to the usage details. So this is the common way of utilizing the trusted keys, uh, using the key CTL that's already there. So, and this, to create a new trusted key, we have these commands. This is just to create a new one, and you print, you just print the key ID, and just, if you want to export that key, we just need to do this command and put it into a blob, and then later load onto the key ring. Now for the encrypted keys usage, uh, you need to provide a reference to the trusted keys uh, for uh, that acts as a master key for that encrypted key. So 
So, you use this as a reference here and rest of the command remains similar like you save that blob, export a blob in the file system and then you could later reload it on onto that. So, uh, about the actual work, so the next, uh, I've already floated a patch set in the upstream for this and the discussions are going on, uh, the review is taking place. So, V2 is already there. Uh, from Opti part, uh, there is a reference pseudo trusted application uh, that is there for testing, but uh, we need to shift from pseudo TAs to the early TAs. So, I, I have to work on it to make it as an early trusted application and just uh, use that required support from the system pseudo TA. So, that's all on my part. Now, I would be happy to take any questions if you may. Uh, you have the mic, oh. uh, please. From here. So you said you are going to use HU key. Yeah. As the, can you uh, comment furthermore on how you plan to use HU key to do so? So uh, it sh it would be a derived key from the HU key uh, that would be handle to this early user TA and that would be used to do that sealing and unsealing operation for this. Okay, so the TA never has access to a key. Yeah, there is already a generic interface that Joachim provided, added in the recently in the OptiOS repo, which just uh, provide derived keys for the user TAs. But it's a new derived key, not the same use for other reasons. Yeah. Uh, we, we shouldn't use a common key for every use case. We should always derive a key. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Could you go up maybe uh, two slides? Further? Uh, or go, back? Go, go forward? Uh, go, go back. Go back. Yeah. Ah. Yeah? Uh, keep, keep going, please. Uh, let's start right, okay, right, right here. Um, so you said here that um, an alternative is to use a, a software-based TPM. Yeah. And even yourself, you said that this could be big and complicated, uh, the software stack. Yes. How does that moving to T help? Because um, whatever you, you do inside of the T, that's still essentially a software-based TPM. Yeah, uh, that's what I was talking about. Like, uh, you have that uh, TCB implementation for this TPM software-based. You, If you move inside a T, that's kind of a 800 to 900K stack you move inside a T. So that's what uh, this small little application could provide the feature set which we, which you are using a whole big stack to move inside Opti. I'm missing something. Um, okay. So you're still running a big stack inside of Re, and you're just move, moving the critical components inside of the T? Is, is that the plan? Uh, no, uh, actually, uh, the TCB provides a software implementation of the TPM. That would be a kind of uh, in the as a run as a trusted application, just compile it, and the interfaces are just changed to communicate it via an SMC. That's the flow they take. So you normally have uh, the TPM as a SPI device or a I2C device. So if you have a firmware TPM based device, you communicate it via an SMC interface to, from the T driver to the TPM in the running as a trusted application. I mean, all, all the normal TCG stack is still in the normal world user space and so on, but when you do the communication, you go down to the T where you have this TCG implementation, I mean the TPM itself. That's why it becomes huge. But we have work on going with that too. <laughs> yeah, there it is. So, I mean, what I understand is you have emulated kind of part of TPM where you are sealing and unsealing keys using the HUK derived key. So, if you have a trusted, maybe a F, uh, firmware TPM which we have been talking about, if that is already sitting over there, so in that case, uh, this would be kind of not used? It's, I mean, kind, uh, it's kind of this, this is not an emulation of the TPM. 
it's kind of just three invoke commands that are there and you could just refer a sudo ta which i have put a link here uh, it provides just uh, the required feature from the t so if you have a firmware tpm that that's if the device allows that kind of space then that could be used here so basically a parallel implementation yeah, parallel where implement, uh, yeah. the trusted keys are basically t based yeah Any other questions? So, okay. And I think we are done. Okay, thanks everyone for attending the session. Yeah.